Welcome to the worship from Daleville Christian Church. This Sunday is Mother's Day, so that the hymn you just heard, at least in one version, begins with God of our fathers, whose almighty hand. So for Mother's Day at Daleville Christian Church, we sing it as God of our mothers, whose almighty hand. This Sunday is also Ascension Sunday, which is why we have the white balloon here. The balloon is going up as if to heaven. Mind you, Luke reports in his book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 3, that after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus appeared to the disciples over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. This week we will be 40 days past Easter. Then the same chapter, verse 9, after Jesus said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. In the ancient world, traditionally, Jesus is depicted as rising into the clouds. We'd like the helium balloons to remind us of Jesus' work in ascending to the Heavenly Father. As the old creed says, Jesus ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I have preached on Mother's Day sermons and Ascension sermons. You may find those on the website. But today we continue our series of sermons concerning Jesus and Satan. But we always have an affirmation of our faith, always taken from God's Word, and this one from the letter of 1 Timothy in the 6th chapter where we read, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time, God, the blessed and only ruler, King of kings, Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. The reading of God's word for today is, therefore, from Luke in the 22nd chapter, verses 31 through 34. Jesus is speaking, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to have you to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. You will deny that you know me. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. I had one of the congregations suggest to me last week that I needed to add something to last week's message. I had mentioned the survival tips for a Christian living in a hostile world, and one of them was remember your training and trust it. I was reminded that some people are definitely following their training, but they have the wrong training. 
That can be true. My son is a trainer of trainers for a software company. He had been sent to another state to train a new staff of trainers. Later, he had to be sent back to that location because the trainers were not following the training they received. They thought they could cut corners. My son had to go to them and say, Remember when I told you to do X, Y, Z? Well, you really have to do X, Y, Z. You can't cut any corners on that. What I was reminded to say to you is this, trust your training and make sure you have certified trainers. That's why new Christians are encouraged to attend Bible-believing churches. The Bible is its own corrective. If you read it correctly or just keep reading it, don't just read a few verses and jump up and go do it. We've looked at this verse Advice from Jesus to one rich man, go and sell all you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. Jesus only said that to one person, that rich man. Some think the man got tripped up by the sell all you have part. I believe the man got tripped up on the follow Jesus part. Jesus encouraged a range of giving. But if that verse is all you read of the New Testament on giving, you might easily get the wrong impression. A Bible-reading church is even better than a Bible-believing church. You and I have certainly seen churches that call themselves Bible-believing, but apparently miss reading large portions of the Bible. So make it a Bible-reading church. A Bible-reading church can encourage you in your correct training that you may remember and trust. Okay, we go on to today's topic, and I begin with a question. Who among you knows what this is? Who has, still has one in their kitchen? Who knows where in this, their kitchen this is located? I didn't really know where mine was. I just knew we had one. Well, that's called a sifter. Some people call this a sifter as well, a mesh handle container. Any of you use a sifter this year? Well, if you can't answer those questions, you may miss out on the lesson today. But knowing what a sifter is might also not be of real help. I'll get to that. But this is a sifter the salespeople call it a stainless steel rotary hand crank holds three cups with two wire agitator sifter. Simon, Simon, Jesus said, Satan has asked to have you to sift you like One commentator states that this word in the Greek for sifting is not often seen or used. As a matter of fact, there's only one place in the entire New Testament that you find that word, and it's right here. This word isn't even used in the standard Greek translation of the Old Testament verses that usually translate to sift. Therefore, one commentator suggests that we focus on the first word Jesus used, Satan demanded to have you. And the word is actually plural. Satan demanded to have you all. But what does that mean? 
Well, do any other scriptures come to mind? How about Job? In the book of Job, we read twice, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that Job has is in your hand. And then in the next chapter, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, Job is in your hand. To have the disciples is for Satan to have them in his hand. Now, what does a sifter do first? Well, it holds the flour or the grain, and then the wire agitator divides up the particles. Satan has demanded to hold you all in his hand in order to divide you and separate you from God the Father. These are not pleasant thoughts. What these verses suggest is terrifying. And what does Satan want to do? Satan intended to test and to tempt the disciples. That's what Satan did to Job. That's what Satan did to Jesus. And that is what Satan wants to do to Peter and the disciples. Now what has that to do with us? Well, we actually hope this verse has nothing to do with us. We hope that Satan never wants to hold us in his hands and then start cranking. But what else do we know about Satan? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Ever heard a roaring lion in person? The lion has the loudest roar of all the big cats. It's so loud it can reach 14, 114 decibels and can be heard as far away as five miles. If the lion is roaring next to you, it's loud enough to be physically painful to your ears. Somewhere between a fire engine siren and a running motorcycle. But if you're that close to a roaring lion, your ears are the last of your worries. Here are some other disturbing facts about a lion. The lion is the second fastest wildcat after the cheetah with a top running speed of around 50 miles an hour. You don't have to be close to a lion to start worrying. Within one mile, within one mile, the lion can hear you. And if I did my math correctly, if the lion hears you and comes after you, you have about three minutes to get to safety, and that's with you running the whole time. That the devil is described as looking for someone to devour suggests that Satan is not particular about his victim. You might be interested to know, according to the Mountain Lion Foundation, do not run when faced with a big cat. As I've already explained, the lion can outrun you. But stand tall, open your coat, raise your arms, look big, maintain eye contact, slowly wave your arms, Speak firmly and throw items at the lion if necessary. Normally, the cat will move on. Seriously, I'm not sure how far to take this advice on what to do when facing a lion. Daniel in the lion's den could not run and did not. 
Ephesians states clearly that when faced with evil, stand. Ephesians 6.10, take your stand against the devil's schemes. And in the next verses, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. Ephesians 6.14, stand firm, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So what goes for facing down big cats goes for facing down Satan. Stand. There's a nice interpretation of these verses in, um, at BibleReference.com. These instructions are near the end of the Apostle's letter. How should believers live? Believing in a real devil, a spiritual enemy who has an agenda to bring harm to Christians. Be sober-minded, be alert. It's the third time in this letter that Peter has urged his readers to be clear-minded. It matters that we are paying attention to our surroundings, to pay attention to what's going on in the world and in our own lives. The letter also suggests that there is a danger beyond the physical harm or persecution some of his readers were facing when he wrote. There's a deeper agenda, far beyond the human faces of evil who might inflict that trouble. The devil is the real enemy of the Christian believer, and Satan's agenda is to separate us from God. To get us to do something other than God's will. This was Satan's intention toward Job. That Job would curse God and die. I think we can say that Job was tempted to curse God and die. That's what Job's wife suggested. But Job's response, should we receive good from God, tan and not evil? The book of Job reminds us, in the first chapter, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name. It's a hard spiritual lesson. Because Jesus was tempted, we usually think of temptation as the usual and more common tool or weapon of Satan. And Satan is called the tempter. The word temptation is used in the Bible up to 25 times, depending on which version you use. <coughs> there are several words in the Greek with the same root words like test or make a trial of, as in a trial run of something, uh, an enticement, an enticement to sin. We might observe that temptation is usually personal. Temptations are geared to your weaknesses and your ability. For example, you and I cannot be tempted to turn stones into bread because we can't do it. So we're never tempted to do that. Jesus could be tempted to turn stones to bread because Jesus had the power to do that, and Jesus was fasting and was hungry at that moment. Recovering drug addicts, recovering alcoholics, and physical therapists all give the same advice. If you think you might slip, stay away from slippery places or slippery situations. Try to make your situation as safe for yourself as possible. And here we could begin the whole armor of God so you can remain standing against the devil. Why is standing so important? Because your thigh muscles are the strongest muscles in your body. If you are on your back, 
you have lost the advantage of strength and power in those muscles. So the apostle states, I should say the apostles state, stand. Stand. Keep standing. So temptations are personal. And you can make your own environment safer for yourself. But temptation often begins in our own mind. Remember this verse, especially those of you who attended the book of James Bible study. James 1.14, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Some versions say enticed by lust or by evil desire. But it's your own desire. So it's personal. If you have no desire for broccoli, you can never be tempted to eat broccoli. But if you have a desire for alcohol, then you can be tempted to drink alcohol and be tempted by James 1.15 goes on to state, Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death, which is separation from God. So what to do with these desires? Well, you certainly do not want the desires to grow. And a person certainly doesn't want to be impulsive about those desires, acting on them when they first show up. Impulse control is learned and should be a part of every child's training. I told my children that children think that being an adult means doing whatever you want to do. But being an adult means not doing whatever it is you want to do. That's being an adult. That's impulse control. So what to do with these desires? Well, you certainly do not want the desires to grow. Let's look at a recovering alcoholic. The recovering alcoholic may think that they certainly would like a drink. There's the desire. The recovering alcoholic might begin thinking of all the good times they had while they were drinking. Because at the moment, without alcohol, they're not feeling very good. They might even be kind of miserable. That's a common problem, recovering alcohol. The recovering alcoholic has to remind himself of all the bad times and all the bad things that happened when they were drinking. As Blake Shelton sang in a song, the more I drink, the more I drink, the more I drink. The recovering alcoholic should rather remember the children's activities they missed while they were drinking, or the family gatherings they missed while they were drinking, or the family gatherings they can't remember because they were drinking, or the automobile accidents, or the injuries to themselves or others that happened while they were drinking. Sometimes I'll read some crazy story in the media, and I often ask, I wonder if alcohol was involved. And usually, alcohol was involved. So sometimes our desires need a reality check. For example, what happened the last time you wanted to eat just one potato chip? What happened when you wanted to eat just one peanut? What happened when you wanted to eat just one donut? Friends, I know what I'm talking about. Now, I'm sure on a more serious subject, I read that young people should be told it's almost impossible to have a little sex. Young people, it's almost impossible to have a little sex. When desire strikes, we don't want to keep thinking about it and nursing it. We want to shine the light of reality on it. 
People who are trying to lose weight should probably stay out of restaurants and bakeries. If you have a desire to lose weight, it's that desire to lose weight that you should focus on. That desire to lose weight is what you can think about. Not the donuts or whatever weakness your weakness happens to be. There was a brilliant commercial over 10 years ago, a commercial for Yo Play Light Yogurt. A young woman in the commercial puts a bikini on a hanger and hangs it up in the front room. They then show the woman walking by the bikini hanging on the wall on different days, and each time she walks by it, she's eating Yo Play Light Yogurt. All the while this is taking place, a song plays in the background. She wore an itsy bitsy, teeny weeny, yellow polka dot bikini. And yes, the bikini hanging up is an itsy bitsy, teeny weeny, yellow polka dot bikini. At the end of the commercial, the bikini you see has been taken off. So the woman, instead of thinking about things she really likes to eat, like maybe ice cream, she has something she wants more than ice cream. She wants to wear that bikini. You know what the genius is of that commercial? They never show the young woman actually wearing the bikini. That is excellent advertising. And that's another way to deal with temptation. Is there something else you want more than what's tempting you? Let me touch on one verse of scripture and also recommend a book to you. I recommend Charles Stanley book, Winning the War Within. I believe Charles Stanley knows what he's talking about, and his advice in that book is sound. He points to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. We'll take a look at it as he does. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. There's a whole sermon there. And Stanley's book also. But let me share a little. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear because he will also provide a way out. This verse is not talking about worldly troubles. And I get that from other Christians all the time. When things are tough, they'll quote this verse. This verse isn't about worldly troubles. No matter how severe the worldly troubles may be, this verse is about tempting you away from God's path or tempt you away from following Jesus. Now, if life has become so terrible that you might give up your faith, then you need to read the entire book of Job rather than just 1 Corinthians 10, 13. This verse is about temptation and notice the verse does not promise that you won't be tempted beyond your ability to bear it. You just might be tempted beyond your abilities, and a way out will also be provided. Should I repeat that? This verse does not promise that you won't be tempted beyond your ability to bear it. You just might be tempted beyond your abilities and a way out will be provided. God will provide a way out of the temptation. I would put it this way. For me, there's always an exit sign on the door of the donut shop. There's always an exit sign on the door of the donut shop. No matter how delicious the donuts look, no matter how many different kinds of donuts are in the case, there's an exit sign always over 
the donut shop door. Temptation is a part of the Christian life while Satan is loose in the world. We pray every week in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. Why did Jesus teach us to pray that? Because evil is here in this world. We don't have to look for evil, it's looking for us. So we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, deliver us from evil. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I don't think any follower of Jesus wants to be tested. I mean, really tested. I would say that the disciples were tested when Jesus was arrested. However, Jesus had told them what would happen so that they would not later be so ashamed. Jesus knew them better than they knew themselves. Peter says, ah. I'll go to prison and death for you. Peter didn't know himself very well, did he? Jesus did. And Jesus still loved him. Jesus knows us better than we know ourselves. And Jesus still loves us. There's a great line in the first Star Wars film when the hero Luke is training with Yoda the Jedi Master. Luke is anxious to start saving the galaxy from the evil empire. Yoda insists that Luke is not yet ready to go. Luke bravely states, I'm not afraid. And Yoda responds, You will be. The naive strength of youth or power must be tempered with a respect for the end. Jesus, in his prayer, taught us to have respect for Satan. Many battles are lost because, many battles are lost in this world because one army underestimated their opponent. So what do we learn about Satan and temptation? Trust your training. Make sure you have certified training. Put on the armor of God, all of it. Stay on your feet. Stand. If you think that you might slip and fall, don't go in there. Don't go into that situation. Even more help is available. There is a way out. But complete avoidance of testing is impossible. Be alert. Test the spirits. And pray the Lord's Prayer. I believe we're almost finished with talking about Jesus and Satan. There are a few other statements in Scripture, including words of our Lord, and we should look at that next week.